So good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to the fourth uh, edition of Cocktail and Conversations. I'm Chris Bent, the president and CEO of Atlantic Cruising Yachts. Uh, really excited about today's um, today's presentation. It's going to be a lot of fun. We've got a great story um, uh, with two good friends of mine that uh, that uh, took off and and had an incredible cruising experience. One that um, that I myself would love to do with my family uh, uh, sooner rather than later. So uh, we're going to give it another minute, and um, uh, we've got a few more folks that registered that are signing on. Uh, we got a really big group today. I think we had 190 uh, people uh, register for today's presentation, today's webinar. So uh, thank you all for uh, for your interest and in, and in signing in. And uh, again, in, the, in another minute, we'll get started. And uh, I look forward to uh, to hearing about Jim and Valerie's uh, great cruising experience. So we'll give it another minute. We'll give everybody the opportunity to. Uh, to get their glass full. I'm drinking a French rosé today in uh, celebration of cruising the Med in the summertime. So cheers, everybody. Cheers. Cheers. What are we drinking, Valerie? We're drinking um, sparkling wine and Aperol, huh? So we're drinking Prosecco with Aperol. It's called an Aperol Spritz. Great summer drink, um, refreshing and um, lovely on the really warm day. One of the many drink recipes you can pick up when you cruise the Mediterranean. We yeah. came back with the food and drink recipe. Sounds perfect for today. It's a, it's a little warm out, outside here in Maryland. So um, again, uh, we'll dive into this now. I'm Chris Bent and uh, a little bit of uh, just background on who I am. I'm, I'm the president of Atlantic Cruising Yachts. We're a large uh, cruising yacht specialist dealership based in Annapolis, Maryland, but also with offices and operations in Fort Lauderdale, St. Pete, uh, uh, Charleston, South Carolina, and uh, very soon a brand new operation uh, for Dufour Yachts in uh, Keymont, Texas. You'll be hearing more about that very soon, but we're excited about that. Uh, I've been working uh, with uh, catamarans and cruising yachts for close to 20 years uh, now, in, uh, both on the sales side and the charter side, and um, uh, met Valerie, oh, probably about eight or nine years ago through our, our work together at Janot. Valerie was working as a marketing, marketing director for Janot, and we were, uh, uh, for a long time, Janot dealers, and, um, and uh, her husband, Jim, uh, we, uh, we've met as well, been out to the house, uh, our place a couple times. And um, in 2015, they decided to go on a, uh, a cruise uh, on, and move aboard their catamaran with their two young children, uh, picking up a new boat in France and sailing the Med and crossing the Atlantic uh, to uh, Barbados and then up the chain of the Caribbean the Windward Islands, the Leeward Islands, and then through the Bahamas, and eventually back home to Annapolis in uh, the summer of 2017. So uh, an incredible trip. And uh, a little bit of background on Jim. So Jim is a, is a very well-known cartoonist for the comic Sherman's Lagoon. I think most people uh, are familiar with that. It's in most of the major newspapers around the country. And uh, Jim does that uh, primarily here, uh, from here in Annapolis in his studio. And uh, Jim's won uh, the Environmental Hero Award uh, for his work with uh, Sherman's Lagoon and and uh, and using you know the art and humor to to uh, help spread the word and uh, uh, about the importance of of, uh, of the marine environment. So um, we're we're really happy to to uh, to know Jim and and proud of the work that he does. Valerie, when she got back from her uh, cruise with Jim in 2017, um, I started chasing her around. I needed a good uh, yacht sales person here in Annapolis, someone that had a lot of experience with this, with catamarans, with cruising. And uh, after a, a few months of, of talks uh, and, and chasing Valerie around uh, school events, our kids uh, were in some of the same uh, 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 running races and things together. I 
she she agreed to come on board and boy ever since then she's just been been uh doing an amazing job and and helping lots of uh lots of new boat owners uh and you know realize their dream and enjoy a new boat so um we're very been very happy to have Valerie with us and and have the opportunity to hear about their story today. So, Jim and Valerie, welcome and thanks uh, you know so much for for joining us and sharing your story with us. Sure, thanks a lot, Chris. It's great to be here. Great to be back on a on a catamaran and brings back great memories. Yeah. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Love those days. Yeah. So uh, just a, the short version of the, the Toomey family's cruising dream. So again, they moved aboard a new catamaran in France with their two young children. How old were, were your kids at the time? Uh, 11 and 13, I believe, when we started the cruise. Wow. Uh, yeah. It's exactly and the age of mine right now. That's, that's, that's terrific. Go. There you go. Lucky you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I put mine to work in the uh, in the charter business, so they're they're learning they're learning all kinds of great things, how to fix <laughs> air conditioning systems and all that good stuff. So then, as I said, they explored Europe and the Med. They did a transatlantic crossing and uh, and then uh, came up through the Caribbean and the Bahamas chain and eventually came back here to Annapolis. So I always like to start off, you know with questions that um, I, I hear a lot with clients that we're working with that are interested in this kind of dream. And, and um, you know, the first one, you know, everybody thinks that you have to, uh, you know, that you have to be some expert and, you know, racing and all this. What kind of background did you guys, I know you had boats before, but what, what was your background before you decided, your background in sailing before you, you decided to take off and do this? Well, it wasn't that deep. I mean, I've been sailing dinghies most of my life, but dinghy sailing and racing really doesn't, there's not a lot of knowledge there that applies to cruising. Um, so we really, you know, you're never prepared enough for a trip like this on one hand, but on the other hand, um, it's sooner or later, you just have to make the jump. And uh, the the jump, you know, wasn't that big uh a deal. In other words, we didn't really get over our heads any time during the cruise, and we gradually got better and better handling the boat as we as we moved on. Our first our first experience with catamarans was we owned a catamaran in charter um, for a couple of years down in the um, uh, the Virgin Islands, and that allowed us as a family to sort of cut our teeth on um, on sailing together and sailing a bigger boat. And occasionally we get into you know squalls and do some night sailing and some longer passages. We we go from the BBI out to Anguilla and uh, St. Bart, St. Martins, and that's a you know a couple night passage. So doing those first night watches was in a in a sort of a friendlier environment um, was was good was good training. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we we really did have about two years of playing around on our own boat. We, we did exactly what we offer in business yacht ownership, where we had our own boat. We could use it as much as we wanted, but we were also able to, to get more familiar with the boat. The idea was, was to use that boat originally and do the cruise with it. Then we changed a little bit our plan and ended up selling that boat and getting a brand new one with a European delivery. But um, the kids loved it. We started doing that. They were probably about seven and nine i guess yeah. when we started cruising with them they were just old enough to appreciate it um uh, but young enough so that um we could take them away from school and take them away from their network of friends uh for extended periods but you know in the day sailing in the racing world you there's a couple of key skills you don't pick up until you just really get out there and cruise one is anchoring for example you know nobody anchors in a race right so my anchoring skills were not that great um until we actually got out and started having to anchor for real out in the Mediterranean and, and the Caribbean. So, um, and that, that took a while. We, you know, um, that was a learning curve, um, you know, sailing in, in heavy weather, because in most heavy weather days, the, the race is scratched and you cancel your sailing trip. So, you know, you're sort of confronted with a lot of conditions on a cruise that you normally wouldn't be confronted with in an ordinary day sail or a race. And those are things that you just kind of have to, deal with um, when you get into them. And 
you know, when we, you know, in our first couple of weeks, we hit 50 knot winds. Um, and it was, uh, you know, it was just a matter of shortening sail and, and uh, you know, getting control of the boat. And it, and it turned out great. Yeah. Well, I, I was, sorry. The great I was, thing about a catamaran is, uh, you know, it's a very stable and safe platform for a family. And, and uh, yeah. you know, to reef is, is pretty straightforward. And, and uh, but, they're fairly forgiving. Yeah, I, I was going to say it's actually easier than you think. We we only experienced a couple of times heavy weather um, and it was not outrageous. It was just like, ooh, then to pay attention. But um, every time we went cruising, they were mostly short hops. And that's what you will do most of the time. It will be a short passage, maybe a day passage, maybe several hours. And you always check the weather before you go. So. Yes, you might get a squall, but it's not like you're going in the storm. If, if there's a storm, you just don't go. You wait two more days and wait for it to pass. So at the end of the day, we hardly ever had really bad weather. Um, I'll tell you, a great way to practice for, for heavy weather is to, uh, uh, you know, go out on the Chesapeake in the, in the middle of July and August, and you're sure to get a, a squall that blows through, you know, about 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock. And that's how I, you know, I learned to, uh, you know, to deal with it because, you know, you, it's, it's not uncommon to see 40 or 50 for, you know, five minutes. And uh, it's a great exercise to reef down and, and uh, prepare you for that sort of thing. So, uh, right. One but of the that was right. crappy weather we get here in the summer. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we, in our mostly coastal cruising, we could access websites that told us the weather. So, you know, if we had a, some challenging weather we could just stay in port and staying in port was great we just had another day of gelato and you know wonderful meals and walking through a quaint town so it's it's yeah. completely imp improvised doesn't sound too bad so no. just getting back to this so what what was like the the turn the, the point you know where you decided hey we're really going to do this how did that happen because you know so many people dream about doing this and never do it you know, for one reason or the other. How did you decide we're doing it? <laughs> He's executing it, but I actually have to tell to make him do it. She's she's the idea person, and then she tells me when she gets the idea, she tells me to do it. So I go out and do it. Oh, okay. just write the check. Right. Perfect. <laughs> like, honey, and you know, she usually expresses it like, "Can we do something? Can we paint the house, or can we take the trash out, or whatever?" So, you know, one day she said can we go on a cruise? And um, that meant the real way that it was really everybody. Um, so yeah, it was, it was her, it was her idea. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I'm a, I'm, I'm a little bit of a dreamer, but I, I like to execute those dreams. Um, Cause I know a lot of people, they think about it and they, at the end they don't do it. And for us, the window was, we needed to do that before the kids went into high school. So we had two years before Madeline would start high school. Um, and so it was a narrow window. After that, we would have had to wait until they were in colleges. And so we decided to do, to go for it. And I'm you know, glad Jim, we did. Jim brought up a good point earlier that, that, you know, it sounds like when you had your boat in the charter program in the Virgin Islands, that you weren't, you know, you, you got off the beaten path a little bit. And instead of, you know, doing the usual uh, circumnavigation of Tortola, stopping at Yost Van Dyke and Norman Island and Cooper Island, you got out there and, and did a couple passages uh, over to Anguilla and, and St. Martin. And that, um, you know, that's an overnight trip and, and you're into the wind uh, for a good bit of it. But very, uh, very doable and manageable, and probably a great experience that gave you the confidence to go further. Yeah, and I think the that? first time we even invited friends over yeah. um, that were also good sailors. So we felt like it was not just the two of us and our kids. We actually invited a, a couple of friends to join us, um, and it was comforting knowing that okay, I was the helper, but he's definitely more the sailor. Um, and having that extra couple adults was, you know, we felt like we were okay no matter what. So yeah, it was fun. Yeah, yeah. doing doing the night watch, um, it it helps to sort of try it in an easy area like the Caribbean, you know, like these runs between BVI and Anguilla or 
or St. Bart's or whatever. That's a that's about a day and a half run, two day run. So you get a good night watch in, and, and you you know your your impulse is to say, all right, I'll stay up all night. You can sleep or whatever. But you know to establish these four hour intervals where you know four on, four off, um, and to do that a couple of times really really boosts your confidence. And then you know ultimately you do the the final exam, which for us was the transatlantic, 20, 20 nights in a row, but and in the med, we were doing two and three nights in a row of, of night watches. And it's really important to come up with a system, not only of just, you know, waking up and taking over, but preparing the meals, um, checking the boat systems, things like that, that you really need to do 24-7 or 24 times, however many days you're out there. Yeah. Yeah. You, you actually, you get into a nice routine when you, you know, after a few days of four hours on, four hours off, it actually you know, gets, gets to be, um, kind of normal and, and, you know, a, a, you know, a normal routine that, you know, the deliveries that I've done. All right. So we made the decision to go cruising. You bought a boat, you, the boat was built, you sold your old boat, um, and over to France to take delivery and to take off. So what was that like? That was awesome. Um, well, as, Everybody knows I'm French, so it was we got to spend a little bit of time preparing, buying things for the boat, preparing things we wanted on the boat. So we were there during the commissioning. We rented an apartment. We were able to not oversee, but keep an eye on what was going on, and then at the same time getting all of the goodies we wanted on the boat. Uh, so we actually really enjoyed that process. It took a little, I think, longer than we thought because I think people think once the boat gets out of the factory, it just you're, you're ready to go. It's actually not. You have to paint the bottom. You have to install your electronics, whatever you, you add on to the boat after factory. And that takes, takes time. Remember, France during the summer usually shuts down in August. So you got to yeah. get it done. And I think we were there in July, most of July, right? End of July. So it was mm -hmm. just before beginning of August, it's yeah. sort of like having a car made on Friday. Everybody's, you know, so kind of have the, have one foot in vacation already. But um, it we spent, we initially went over to Les Sables and we rented an apartment for a week um, and lived in that while the, the boat was in the in the boatyard and the mast was stepped and, and all the sort of the heavy duty stuff, the water maker was being installed. And then when they finally splashed the boat after a week, we moved on to the boat and sat in Les Sables um, Harbor for another really 10 days. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, <laughs> It was nice. I mean, we really weren't in a particular hurry to get going. Actually, it was a pretty nice thing. So, yeah. but learning how to work the water maker, uh, learning how to work the electronics, um, just making sure the the boat was all outfitted. Uh, yeah. It was a lot of fun. It's like buying a new house and furnishing a house. It's just going out and getting all the toys. It's a lot of fun. Yeah, <laughs> and it's it's important to uh, you know to go out to use the boat. Uh, you know, we we've, we've done. We've talked about this in, in other uh, episodes of cocktails and conversations on the commissioning side, but it really is a process. Uh, you know, it's not like buying a car where you show up and you get the keys and off you go. Um, you know, there there is a process. There's there's the factory portion of it, and there's the aftermarket work. And of course, with Atlantic Cruising Yachts, we have a staff in France that that you know oversees all that and, and manages all that, which makes it uh, go a lot better. But you know, trying all the light switches and testing everything um, because it's easier to, you know, obviously you can get things addressed and fixed on, underway and the different ports, but it's it's easier to deal with it, you know, right there at, at the beginning. Um, but right. that part of France is is a great, is, is a beautiful area there in La Rochelle. And uh, it, it's it's a great place to uh, to spend some time. So, you know, I always kind of recommend, you know, for, for our clients that are taking delivery of a new boat in France and doing what you did, you know, to, to go over there a month before and, you know, get, get to know the area um, and, uh, you know, be, be there when the boat is launched like you did. It's, I think it's a, it's a great experience. It's a lot of fun and you, and you learn a lot. So from there, I'm going to just turn on my little highlight pen. So you started up here in, uh, the west coast of France, uh, near La Rochelle, and uh, 
from there you have uh, it looks like you know a lot of our delivery skippers will just kind of cut this corner and head straight for Karuna on the northwest tip of Spain. You went down and enjoyed uh, the, the you know the north coast of Spain, the Costa Verde, I think they call it, yeah. and uh, went around to Porto, right? That was the first step. Yeah, we did. Yeah, we started. So our our point of across the Bay of Biscay was Bilbao and Santander, and then that whole coast. Every coast is so different. You know that 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 particular coast. Um, had a lot of beautiful beaches and not a lot of rocks. Um, it's, you know, that that area is famous for surfing. So, the, you know, on shores, there's, there's a lot of big waves and so forth. Out of sea, it wasn't so bad. Yeah. But we turned the corner at Acarunia, we got into the, the Rias and there was beautiful rocky coasts and islands offshore that were all um, national parks. And it was just uh, phenomenal. Um, every, every coast had a different um, quality to it. Yeah. yeah. I had my first trip to Portugal last summer, and I was blown away by the the coast and the cruising there. It's 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 really beautiful, it, um, it, and it's very different from the west coast of France. It's and very very different from the Mediterranean coast. Uh, very the special beach, place. Yeah, the beaches in Portugal are just epic. They're just big, wide, white sandy beaches with cliffs and. A lot of them, if you're if you can just anchor off and access them with your dinghy, you're the only one in sight. It's it's just heaven. Yeah. How long did you stay in Portugal? Probably three weeks, maybe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Nice. Two. Maybe two. Yeah. Something yeah. like that. We love Porto. It took us. It took us. Um, we had 90 days when we left France to get to Gibraltar. So we we had a timeline. We knew we had to be in Gibraltar by by then uh, to do the export customs. So we didn't pay um, VAT, which is 20 percent. Definitely not something we want to do. And for the Euro delivery, if you do that, once you hit Gibraltar, you do your custom, and then you're free to go into the Med and and start really exploring without having a timeline. So, and we got there just only a, a few days before because we actually took our our time to go around. Yeah. Yeah. So you yeah. it looks like you arrived in Gibraltar in October at the start of the fall and and then made your way up uh the coast of Valencia and the coast of Brava of Spain and and into France. That's correct. Yeah. 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 So, it, was, um, it was like sailing in one giant buffet table. It was <laughs> amazing, you know, that every every town would have a different flavor of local wine and um you know, a different cheese and there was a there's a, a, a meat or a cold cut in Spain. Pata Negra. Pata Negra, which is quite expensive, but it's just like uh, it's like heaven. It's yeah. like eating a slice. It's like of a prosciutto, but you know, yeah. style. Yeah, and so so every little village had some little specialty, and and it, you know, we were in no particular hurry. Yeah, it's a uh, it's a gorgeous part of the world for sure, and then um, and then. It looks like you stopped for the winter in uh, in the south of France in in uh, yeah. Saint Tropez or Marseille. Antibes, actually, uh, between Antibes. Nice and Cannes. Yeah. Um, there's a little town called Antibes, which is actually a fairly big port. We got very lucky; that was not really planned. Yeah. And Jim had a lecture in Monaco, actually, and that's why we were like trying to hit November. Uh, in Monaco and right after Monaco I started calling around to find out if we could find a place um, to spend the winter everything was full and then I called Antibes and they say oh wait I think we might have a spot for you and it worked out so perfectly because they had a spot spot opening for us until April and yeah. we were able to, to be downtown right um, it was a short walk to town with a fresh yeah. market every day um, we were able to do a little bit of inland trips. We went skiing, we went visiting inland. We had my family visit. So it was super, super, super great town. Um, yeah. We had a blast. Yeah, you know, initially we saw the winter layover as kind of a yeah, waste. dull, mm -hmm. as a waste. You know, we were thinking maybe we should just fly home. But uh, it was actually just as much fun in, in a lot of ways because, you know, for four months we immersed ourselves in. The, the culture of a small town in France, the kids took uh, ceramic lessons. I, I volunteered for the local um, uh, volunteer, uh, SNSM, Coast Guard. Yeah. 
So, uh, so we really kind of wove ourselves into the fabric of, of the town there, and it was, it was a lot of fun. And then team in the winters, it's a beach town, so in the wintertime, it's really just the locals that, that live there. And, and uh, so we really became a local, and we got to know a lot of, a lot of people. Yeah, it's a that is a beautiful town. Don and I, uh, my wife Don and I, spent a little time in Antibes and really enjoyed it. It's a uh, beautiful. It's got the medieval center and and the and the you know the port. Yeah, and all that. great great mm -hmm. spot. Um, and and so you got up into the Alps and did some skiing. That's that's pretty pretty yeah, awesome. Friends, they were ski uh, instructors in um uh the last 2000 and we we were blessed we met so many nice people that's the one thing about cruising you'll meet people along the way you'll become friends for life and they they're so happy to show them to show you their 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 place their specialty whatever and everywhere we went um we we ended up meeting people that were like would take us on weekends or you know show us around invite us for dinner um you can see that the family that played music. We met them at one of the marina, and they started doing a little concert with their five, with their three kids, and they all played an instrument. And it was wow. a little German couple with their kids. You know, super casual. You know, um, great memories. One one thing we discussed that I thought in in the beginning of the trip was going to be a liability was the stars and stripes on the stern, the the American flag, and. Uh, you know, for for a lot of reasons, you know, there were refugee issues and other things, and but it turned out to be a real asset. Um, it was a it was a conversation starter with everybody over there. We made so many friends. We had people come up to the boat saying that you know they'd been to this part of America or whatever. And you know, our first day in Antibes, uh, we met a woman who invited us. We we got there a couple of days before Thanksgiving, and she invited us into our home. And she made us a French version of Thanksgiving, and it was wow. unbelievable. And so we made so many friends um, that and, way. It was yeah. it was amazing. And just because they needed some tools, we we loaned them some tool for. And then the next day, she came back and said, "We'd love to have you for dinner." And they were the ski instructor that we met, and we're still in touch to this day. Oh, that's um, so great. Just wonderful, you know. Alongside the way, I have, I have to say, um, cruisers are actually. All, all backgrounds, some are really casual, some are more wealthy, but overall, everybody loves sharing experiences and if they can help you, it happens so many times in so many different places. Um, people will take time to help you repair something on your boat if they know how or if they might. It's just wonderful. That is one thing about cruising that was really refreshing. It's like having a little neighborhood and people are there to help you um yeah. so fantastic yeah you hear it's, about the community the, the cruising community and it really is a real it's a real thing you know everybody really has that bond so yeah after the winter in in uh the south of france you did the coast of italy went around the boot and then up to croatia down the coast of croatia through uh Montenegro through Montenegro and then into uh, through Greece and into the Cycla uh, Cyclades. Tell us yep. about that. Go. Oh, so many great places. I mean, Croatia is known for cruising, right? But Italy, the coast of Italy, oh my gosh, Positano, we, oh, I, I don't even know how many places we went. We went to Rome, we went to Firenze, we we cruised basically the whole coast and most of our hops were just like four six hours in between just beautiful yeah. food beautiful people great and you know looking at a country from the coast i mean you can see in this picture it's gorgeous and you have this you're you're back a little bit so you have this beautiful view and you the view from a boat is unparalleled i mean it's it's lovely to look at the ocean, but I tell you, a view from a boat, looking at a country, at an island, whatever, you can see castles, you can see beautiful landscapes, and Croatia was stunning, I mean, mm -hmm. really, truly fabulous. Dubrovnik was fantastic. I mean, all those yeah. places. There, there are the big glamour spots like like Rome and uh, Dubrovnik and, um, you know, Athens and things, but the beauty of cruising in the Med is that if you only want to cover 10 miles that day there's 
chances are there's a beautiful little village 10 miles away with a nice port or a nice anchorage and you can go 10 miles if you want to go 50 miles there's the destination that's 50 miles away as, as well so you can kind of tailor your your day towards you know any amount of sailing you want to do along along the coast of the med um so if you want to go 100 miles you can do that as well you hear about, you know, people say how crowded the Met is for, with boats and things. It sounds like you just kind of cruised along at your own pace and didn't worry too much about finding a spot. You know, was it, did you, I mean, other than a place to find for the winter, did you, what, you know, did you run into serious problems with, uh, no, did you anchor no. a lot? Did you, you know, no. getting no, green? Was what was that like? We, we never, uh, we never were stuck without a port or an anchorage. Um, and it, like I said, if you know, if for some reason a particular port didn't work out, which is pretty rare, we could just go five miles down the coast and and find another one. Some, you know, there are some particularly busy ones, but there are other ports that were just beautiful, quaint little fishing ports that weren't particularly touristy. And we were the only recreational boat in a marina full of you know working fishing boats, mm -hmm. and that was nice too. But yeah. we never had an issue with uh, finding a place to, to stop in the night. Yeah. Amazing. Our, our favorite was really if we could, if we had a choice between anchoring and, and, and going into port, we definitely liked anchoring better. Um, yeah. A little trickier in, in, in Croatia because it's pretty deep. And, but most of the place we really prefer being on anchor than being in a port. Um, being in port has the advantage if there's weather, you're totally protected. But we never had the issue. I mean, we always found a spot. Yeah, um, and we learned the, the art of med mooring, which was a little tricky was in the beginning. Ask about that. Yeah, a lot <laughs> of people have said. So tell us about that. So our, our first med mooring adventure was a scream fest. You know, I was I was on the wheel. Um, we had a stand up paddleboard, so our 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 routine would be to, you know, tie the stern lines on and send the kids out. Actually, no, I'm sorry. We'd send the kids out with, with lines. They would find a tree or a rock and they would come back to the boat with the stern lines and we'd tie a stern line port and starboard. Um, and I would, you know, we'd, so we'd back, we'd drop anchor in about 30 feet of water and back down, set the anchor. And then at that point, the kids would meet us with, with the line and we'd have everything secure. Well, it took about 20 times for that to actually happen right. <laughs> He was losing patience. I was I was just tearing my hair out sometimes. Um, so that that's a, out in a natural environment. Some in the marinas you have to med more as well, which is a little trickier in some ways, but easier in some ways. And the, the tricky part about med mooring in a marina is oftentimes the dock hands will you know tell you this is your slot, and you we know, we have a 25 foot beam boat, and you've got a 27 foot slot, and mm -hmm. the whole town's watching. And your neighbors on the mega yachts are watching so that you don't scratch those boats. And you've got every fender on the on the boat out, and that really intimidated me. Um, but you know, the beauty of a cat is that with the differential steering and the fact that it's really so massive, um, it was a, it was actually pretty easy to back down a cat in a crowded marina with with a tight slip. Um, yeah. We did it a hundred times without an incident, and uh, in the end. It, it got really routine. That was that was the one part uh, that really intimidated me, though. It's it's all about getting out there and doing it. You know, you do it a couple exactly. times, and then it's it's end of discussion. You know, so right. that's what I try to tell people that you know that uh, first time with a with a big boat, a big catamaran. You know, maybe they had a you know a small boat, and um, you know everybody's concerned about docking. And with the cats, you're you're right. It's you've got the the engine space wide apart, uh, twin engines, and you really can turn them on on their center line and 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 back them in. And and you can go slow. That's the key is is to go yeah. slow. Exactly. So um, well, that sounds like an incredible uh, time in Europe, and makes me hungry to go do it. I I love the Med personally, and 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 sailing over there, and uh, it's it's definitely what you did is is on my list of things to do uh probably a lot of the folks that are sitting in uh, listening to this as well so thanks for sharing that so now the next part um 
boy, this is exciting. I, I did this on Google, just uh, sat with Valerie and we retraced your trip. And when you pull it out on the globe like this and see the, the amount of the, of, you know, of, of the world that's involved in this passage, it's pretty impressive. So you left Gibraltar and then headed south uh, to the Canaries to Tenerife to pick up the mm -hmm. trade the trade winds and then hopped across. I think you went with uh, with a group of boats. So talk to us a little bit about the crossing, you know, and and how did you prepare for it and what were, what was your your plan and and what was it like? Well, um, I'll, I'll go first anyway. So. <laughs> That, you know, again, that was, I talked about that as the final exam earlier in our talk. And um, it really was, you know, after a year and a half of cruising, we felt very confident. Uh, we'd been through a few, you know, heavy weather issues and we'd seen everything, but we hadn't seen 20 days straight of no land. <laughs> and, um, you know, all the, all the things that come along with that, the inability to, you know, get help and, and uh, communication and all that. So, we felt like okay, if, um, the we we thought the best way to do this would be to join a rally, um, and uh, you know just be with twenty or thirty other boats that were in the same situation, and learn from them and and um, prepare with them. So we joined the Jimmy Cornell Atlantic Odyssey rally. Jimmy Jimmy is the founder of the Ark, um, which has turned into more of a race and you know kind of a more of a professional um event it's, it's a big event so we opted for something smaller i think that uh, was a and, and we there was a lot more kids in our group yeah the, than there is on the arc on the arc it's usually adults and it's like 300 boats this this group was what 32 boats or something like that it was 23 boats it was and it was almost all families and yeah. cruisers and um so we got to and it launched out of tenerife canary islands so um, we we just had to show up around 1st of November. Um, then the seminars started and we were all docked in the same marina and we were all provisioning together and learning together and you know comparing notes. And we were all pretty much had the same level of sailing experience. We're all a little bit nervous about this 2,700 mile, 20 day um, ocean crossing. Um, and uh, it started like a race. He actually started it like a race. He had a starting line. He had a starting time, 11 a.m., starting gun, and all 23 of those boats were out there like like a race starting. Wow. I think he just wanted to get rid of us. Yeah. <laughs> it was like, you know, you go now or you don't go. So it was like his little gimmick for getting rid of all 23 boats at the same time. Well, it was fun. It was celebrating seeing all those boats, yeah. different shape, monohull, multi-hull, new, right. old, all sizes and all different crew from so many countries. Um, but it, it was funny because at the end of the day, what, two days later, we could not see anybody. <laughs> right. We see some of them on our radar, but we could not see any other boats, which was to me amazing thinking, yeah. oh my gosh, we're only like two days in and there's nobody around. <laughs> yeah, literally scattered to the wind. We were alone. Um, it's a big ocean. Yeah. It's a big ocean. It's a big ocean. Yeah. But it, to me, it was never worrisome. You know, you have this, I think it's a little bit more psychologic where you have to get over the, oh my gosh, I'm scared. No, we're not. It's like we've been doing this for now a year and a half. This is just a little longer passage. That's the exact same thing. Yeah. I was worried about having food. Oh my gosh, I probably have food for we, three months. <laughs> we, we ate a third of the food. Uh, yeah. The water were fine, but we had enough. Uh, water jerry cans to if the water maker broke that wouldn't be an issue so you know there are just certain obvious things we had enough fuel to literally motor across about two-thirds of it anyway um so did, for did us the, over did the rally organizers help you with uh you know with sort of those preparations you know giving you some resources on what to think about and so forth yes they, they did inspect the boat they would inspect the boat for safety for gear to make sure yeah. we had like emergency there were certain things that were required certain things was that were suggested that would be a good idea um so of course we were all trying to make sure we had everything squared away they would check the rig they would check you know everything on our boat um and there were seminars um you know we on there was a week weeks worth of seminars on some of the things you've never done before like checking weather with a weather with a satellite phone 
downloading a, a NOAA synoptic chart with a satellite phone, mm -hmm. things like that that um, you know you you would never would do unless you go out in the middle of an ocean. Um, so by the time we shoved off, we were pretty confident. I mean, we tried all these things on shore. We downloaded these weather charts on shore, and we got used to using the sat phone. We got used to um, you know uh, just being um, you know sticking to a routine on 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 a boat so yeah and what was the weather like out there for in in december uh for so 20 days december, right it was late november early december and it was you know so hurricane season as you know ends on the first of november and so it's the, the sort of the azores high really doesn't build up um into a strong wind until the new year january february and so the it's a, still a pretty weak high pressure in in late November, early December. So in the beginning, we hit some patches of very, very heavy winds. We had 30 knots. We had, you know, 15 foot swells, um, which we handled fine. I mean, um, it was it was no big deal. Mm -hmm. um, we had a solid boat. We had a solid crew. And uh, uh, it was just all about, you know, we we actually didn't reef sails in the end. So we were hitting 30 knots. Um, and most of that, most of that transatlantic is, is dead downwind. Um, yeah. But at that particular point, just at a canary, we were hitting broad reaches and beam reaches and 30 knot winds. And instead of reefing, uh, we would actually just sail downwind and take, uh, take the apparent wind down that way. So if you yeah. just turn quickly downwind, we, we'd take that apparent wind from 30 down to 25, 23, and we'd save a reef, and and then when the wind died, we'd sort of head up again. Mm -hmm. So there are there are techniques that you'd use just to save save labor and and save the the pain of you know all that stuff. Yeah, um, I, I'll say a couple of things. When we left um, uh, Tenerife, we our insurance company actually wanted us to have one extra adult on board, and we were very lucky. We 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 actually put a little ad. Uh, on one of those websites and we came across this gentleman from Toronto, Canada, who was a sailor, was a racer, was very qualified, had never sailed on a catamaran and Don joined us and it was awesome. It, it was nice for us to have one third person. We didn't have to, but it was nice because our, our shifts were four hour each and we could cover the night uh, with him. And um, obviously our kids were not doing shifts. Sometimes they would stay up with us kind of, and then they would fall asleep. But um, it allowed us to not get so tired. And we knew if there was a heavy weather, we had a third adult that could give us a hand. So it give us, gave us a little more confidence. Um, we, so, yeah. We did yeah. insist on kids doing a watch. <laughs> and uh, about, you know, 10 minutes into it, they'd either be asleep or have their face in you know, our the DS, the <laughs> Nintendo. It's yeah. like some kind of watch you're you're doing here, huh? We're gonna run into a break. <laughs> oh. Well, four-hour watches are pretty civilized, you know. Like I said yeah. earlier, you can, you can get used to those pretty quickly. Well, these yeah. are great pictures that I found. Uh, you know, uh, some of them probably were at port, but just you know, the daily life, the haircuts. You know, these are all the things that you, you, say, you, oh, you don't think cool. about. But but uh, you know, 20 days. Uh, yeah, exactly. I think all of us now have a have a lot have a feel for what uh, what a transatlantic's like after uh, after going through the quarantine. <laughs> yeah, I have to say, William. Unfortunately, William, um, I was never seasick the whole two years we went. Um, neither were you, um, <clears throat> Madeleine. Maybe there were a couple times when they were reading and you know looking at something close to your face might make you a little queasy. But William was always very sensitive. And typically, if we were on a passage and it was a little maybe rougher than he was comfortable with, he would, um, at the beginning, he would eat normally and two minutes later, that was gone. And then he would sleep the rest of the way. So by the end of the cruise, he knew that if he wasn't feeling well, he would just sleep. And he would sleep for 10 hours and then just get up whenever. And by then, yeah. things had settled and he was fine. But, if, you know, if you're if you're afraid the transatlantic is going to be monotonous, um, some some people are terrified because of the danger, and it's really, you know, that's another thing altogether. But it wasn't monotonous at all. I mean, every sunset there were 20 sunsets, and each one was 
unbelievable and different. And in the morning watch, I did the, what did I do? I did uh, uh, two to, I did two to six. So I oftentimes I'd, I'd be on watch for sunrise. And uh, I remember one sunrise about three days into it, um, I saw this gigantic shape off our starboard. Uh, it looked like a submarine. It was bigger than our boat. It was big, white, light gray shape. And uh, and then the back popped out, and uh, I realized it was it was an enormous whale. And um, I you know looked up the whale charts, and it was a it was a fin whale, which is the second biggest whale uh, besides a blue whale. This thing was bigger than our boat, and it was swimming next to us like a dolphin for about a half an hour. That wow. swam in front, swam behind us. I got everybody on deck, and uh, you know it, it was more. And it was it was a morning. It was a sunrise. It was. It's some of some of the most unbelievable moments are are those uh, sunrises on watch and you know it's quiet the sails are full of wind and it's just it's just uh, uh, I will remember those mornings the rest of my life. Yeah, I was going to say those are things you never forget. Yeah, I actually really enjoy the crossing. I know uh, if you ask my kids, they're going to say, "Oh, it was boring because there was no internet," but they read a lot. Um, we took a swim. One of the the yeah. person we were crossing the Atlantic with ran out of water. A person left the, the shower on the backside of the boat on and they lost all their water. We had a water maker, so we were able to turn around, meet them, hand them some water. Um, so we wrapped it up. We were <laughs> almost in the middle of the Atlantic. We Literally. were 1,300 miles from Africa, 1,300 miles from the Caribbean. We were in about 10,000 feet of water. Um, I looked at a chart afterwards and we it was, all went for a swim. It was dead calm, so we we wrapped it up. We handed over Jerry cans of water, and we all went for a swim in 10,000 feet of water. Wow, it was <laughs> that's pretty it was cool. It was warm, actually. It was very warm. Yeah, mm -hmm. and uh, it was fantastic. I I had a really incredible um, night watch where I think we were almost oh, um, yeah. uh, arriving in Barbados, and I actually had a meteorite. And I, first I thought it was meteorite. There, yeah. Meteorite. I something came with a flash of light and I, I first thought oh my gosh there's an airplane falling off the sky and it took me a second I'm like wait a minute and it was really close to the boat but it, you know I couldn't call anybody to come see it because it was only a few seconds but it was absolutely the most incredible sight I've ever seen and um, yeah, those are the things that make it special mm -hmm. uh, it, there's always something you know okay. always Sounds like you both really enjoyed the crossing, you know, and, and that's, uh, um, it, we have a lot of, not a lot, but a, a, a fair number of our clients have opted to sail with the delivery skipper uh, from La Rochelle across the ocean mm -hmm. to either the Caribbean, to the Caribbean or here to Annapolis or Fort Lauderdale. Um, and all of them rave about the experience, you know, I, this, I guess the ones that don't rave are the ones that get off in, in uh, Madeira or Canaries, and a few have, um, you know, that yeah. weather coming out of the Bay of Biscay, depending on the time of year, can, can be a little discouraging. But afterward, you know, when you do get into the Atlantic, uh, it's, it's uh, um, from what mm -hmm. I understand, it's pretty, pretty nice, pretty nice trip. Yeah. Yeah, it's a dead so, downwind almost the whole time. Literally right. dead downwind. You can you can understand why all those ships, you know, in Columbus's day were just built to run because that's yeah. all it is. It's just, yeah. Your wind is on your 180 the whole time. Yeah. So, so having pretty, a good zero makes it nice. So pretty much after leaving Gibraltar and you know, the wind was behind you probably the whole way up through the Bahamas and into Charleston almost. My guess. Once we pass the right. Yeah. Well, so um, you first go south. Oh, we're talking about the Bahamas now. Yeah, yeah, but um, yeah, I, it was it was either a broad reach or a run for for that run from Freeport to Charleston. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we had easterlies all through the Caribbean as well, as you know. I mean, mm -hmm. the the trick was to stay on the leeward side of a lot of these islands because these easterlies coming off the uh, the open Atlantic were were really strong. So when we'd run in between the islands. When we'd run in between, you know, uh, Guadeloupe and St. Lucia or whatever, we'd we'd hit 30 knot winds and big waves. Yeah. And then behind the islands, which had pretty high hills, we'd have civilized winds, you know, 15 knots and flat seas. It was nice. 
Yeah, yeah it, it built and the seas pile up on the east side as well. Like that, even that little patch between uh, St. Vincent and Beckway is uh, notorious, you know, it howls yeah. through there. So, yep. yeah, one day so I you, remember Beckway. you came into yeah. Barbados and then from there, it looks like you went all the way down and then back up or down to Grenada or what's, what did you do there? Not quite. Yeah, we, we, um, let's see. We did Union, um, St. Lucia. Uh, we went as far south. Well, we stayed in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Uh -huh. uh, but we, uh, we went as far south as, uh, let's see here. Jimmy's looking at our yeah. log. Uh, Canawan, um, Tobago Keys is about as far south as we went. Um, yeah. That's a beautiful area. It's, um, you know, it's, it's a national park. It's a few, a few islands that are undeveloped and shallow water and just gorgeous diving and, and turquoise water. It's wonderful. Mm -hmm. And then so we, and then we just island hopped back. We had actually Valerie's parents flew over to visit us for that, for that leg of the trip because they're, mm -hmm. they're French and getting to Guadeloupe and and Martinique was was pretty easy for them, um, and then we headed north a, after that. Yeah. I'm a so, I'm a warm person, so give me the Caribbean, give me the Bahamas, and I have, I'm a happy <laughs> clear water. Yeah, the French so islands was, were nice. This was in well, December and January, February. But yeah, well, we we went home for Christmas. Yeah. And we left the boat in um, Martinique. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we came back around the middle of January and, and started them. With a dog. We brought our dog back, which we okay. had a friend to watch for a year and a half. And the kids were like, we're only going back to the boat if the dog comes with us. Yeah, that was the ultimatum from the kids. <laughs> they, they were like, all right, you know, if we can bring the dog back. So we actually had to get the dog classified as a service animal, which <laughs> <laughs> probably shouldn't have said that out loud. I, what anyway. I we couldn't, we couldn't fly the dog, but we ended up bringing the dog, and the dog doesn't really care for the water, but actually was great because catamarans are so easy with kids or with pets or older people. I have to say it was a great platform. We could not have done that on a monohull necessarily with yeah. our dog, uh, but on a cat, it's super easy. Yeah. And the dog was in a week, knew where she had to go and was, you know, yeah. it was it was a great companionship too for the kids. I think it was nice for them to get there pet and and it made our the last section of our trip which was six more months really fun very you know the kids were happy then they they had they had their dog and they were they were yeah. satisfied <laughs> and warm water and warm water warm shallow turquoise water dolphin uh, swim coral turtles reef. lots of whales we um we almost hit a whale believe it or not a couple of times um and uh, it's, you know, I thought, who could possibly hit a whale? <laughs> you know, it's, it's kind of hard, but they would actually show up underwater in front of us, right in front of the boat, um, you know, five or six feet underwater, you could see them passing by. So um, we had a couple of, you know, where we, a couple of times where we had to alter course to get around whales. No kidding. Yeah, this is just under the surface. So it's, uh, it's actually fairly easy to do. Um, and the kids swam with dolphins um, oh, up in uh, the uh, Guadeloupe. Uh, we had the Caribbean was amazing. It was, it was a different, very different from the Med because it was very water oriented. We had dive gear, so we spent a lot of time in the water, um, diving, swimming, paddle boarding. Very different from the Med, which is was more you know shore excursions and cuisine right. and culture and language. Um, there's plenty of culture and language in the Caribbean, but there was a lot more of the water sports and things like that as well, which was fun. Yeah. And then up through the up through the Bahamas um, into looks looks like uh, Nassau and Eleuthera, and then um, doesn't look like you went through the Abacos, but from from. We didn't uh, have to. Yeah, you know the Bahamas. I think was was heaven for for anybody on a boat. It's the only way to see the true Bahamas is is on a boat. Yeah. Um, the water is, um, you know, for anybody who's been there, it's just absolute heaven. There's so many islands, the Exumas, for example, that are completely undeveloped. Um, you can just jump in your dinghy, 
find a sandy beach and just hang out and um, play in the water. It's just, it was just heaven. Yeah, the I love color the of the water in the Bahamas is unlike anything in the world, I think. It's, it's, uh, and, it, and you're by yourself. You know, most of the time, you won't see another boat. You're like, yeah. you have your private island, your private beach, you know, just gorgeous. With that said, there were there are some cruising communities there that were interesting. So when we were anchored off of um, Georgetown, Georgetown um, there was a cruising community that you know it's full of transients, but um, there was always a radio broadcast. There was a sort of a designated DJ, and over VHF, they would every every morning at nine and every evening at six or whatever they would they would broadcast the weather. They would broadcast uh, items for sale, items needed, crew needed things like that. And and up near um, Shroud Key or Staniel Key, I guess, um, there was another little beach that was a, sort of a permanent encampment for cruisers. And every night there was a barbecue and, uh, you know, people hanging out and trading stories. And so there's lots of little pockets of communities where the, the location is permanent, but the, the membership is transient. And if you, you can hit it at any time and, and jump into these parties and and sometimes we would see boats that we saw in the Med. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and we so connected, it's which a, was amazing. It's an amazingly small community. And those 23 boats that we crossed the ocean with were all, a lot of them were bopping around in, in the Caribbean as well. And we were, you know, instant friends with them. We could jump in the dinghy and go, you know, have a bottle of wine with them. And, um, you know, it was it was amazing. Well, that's qu quite a quite a lot of cruising that you packed into two years. It's uh, you know because e any one of these regions here, you could spend a lot of time, but you you saw a lot. And um, and then after the Bahamas, you popped up to Charleston and hopped your way up the coast around Hatteras and into into the Chesapeake. Back and got back in June, as I recall, June of 2017. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Back yep. to Annapolis. Yeah. It was strange. It actually felt really strange getting back home. We had kept our house. We were able to rent our house while we traveled. And uh, it was like this bittersweet. We did it, but then we're like, it's over. So it was like, in a way, it was, oh, wow, we really did it. All our friends, we had a big party uh, actually right behind us, <laughs> one of the morning balls downtown yeah. uh, for my birthday, actually, in October. We still had our boat. And it it was a little bit of sweet for me. I was I wasn't sure I was ready to come back. <laughs> she could have spent she could have spent the rest of our lives out, out on the boat. I loved and it. I you know I could have as well, but I was I think I was eager to put the kids back into a school for a little while. Um, homeschooling we didn't touch on it much, but homeschooling was great. Um, it's very efficient. The kids can learn pretty much everything they needed to learn in about a couple hours, which frees yeah. them up to learn real life stuff like sailing or history or language or ocean stuff or whatever. So they, you know, they, they really learned a lot from the school of real life. Um, I think and we, we uh, you know, we, we, a lot of us realize now with that have kids that went through the, the shutdown with COVID that homeschooling is not a big, I mean, it's, it's very doable. And, uh, you know, our kids were at home uh, uh, and doing homeschooling and, and, that was always kind of daunting to me, you know, uh, how how we would do that because I'm I'm not a teacher. <laughs> Neither yeah. am I. None of us. Yeah. None of us. Yeah. You know, it, but, we bought a package um, for some of it, and and then we you know we augmented it with toys. We had a telescope. We had a star finder on our iPad. We had a USB microscope. And none of this stuff. I mean, we didn't spend a lot of money. The USB microscope was thirty bucks. You plug it into your laptop computer and you've got, you know, a, a microscope. You can stick this little end into um, a cup full of seawater and see all the little microorganisms. So there were wow. a lot of little ways that aren't particularly expensive that you can you can buy to augment all the, the education. Yeah. Very cool. Well, that's that's an incredible trip. And uh, I guess the, the question at, uh, of the hour is when are you going back? When the kids are in college, give me yeah. three more years and I'm bring another cat. <laughs> yeah. Well, we may, I mean, we, we'd we really love to get back into the boating. Um, you know, we had a charter boat down in the Caribbean or down in, you know, Puerto Rico, and we'd love to, we'd love to get in back into that sooner. Um, in a lot of ways, it's, uh, it's more fun than having a, 
you know, a, a home somewhere in a, uh, you know, fixed somewhere in a ski slope or whatever, you, you, you can make it. I know a gal, a very talented uh, yacht consultant that can help you with that problem. <laughs> I yeah, I wake up with her every morning. I hear about it all the time. She'll she'll probably be the the one that um that tells me to do it. She'll it'll be her idea and I'll execute it again, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. Good man. Well, well th thanks for sharing that. Um that's a it's an incredible story and, and uh, I think we probably ought to um maybe get together again if you're if you're willing to do it and and uh because it's such a big amount of, of information and so much that you did is maybe talk about the Caribbean a little more next time, what your favorite islands there were and, and, and do this again in the, in the coming months. Um, I, I think, uh, I think it'd be a lot of fun to do that. Um, meantime, for those of you that are looking to find out more about, uh, this or maybe, uh, get started with it. Um, uh, chartering a boat is always a great way to, to uh, explore a new area, to discover sailing and cruising. Um, our charter company, Waypoints Yacht Charters, uh, we have partners in the Virgin Islands and the, and, the, and the Bahamas and Florida, here, of course, in the Chesapeake and Annapolis, and a um, uh, great way to, to get your feet wet and, and, and learn about cruising for a few days on a boat or expanding your horizons and, and getting into the Caribbean and, and elsewhere. Um, learning about how to outfit, equip, and prepare uh, a cruising catamaran. We, we had a, 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 an episode of Cocktails and Conversations on that. Um, we'll be doing more of those. In fact, we're, and we're shooting some video on that next week here with Ken Crasco, our commissioning expert who's put so many of these boats together and can talk to you about water makers and solar panels and all the stuff that you need to, to do this kind of thing. And uh, to learn about what Jim and Valerie did, you know, for their first boat, uh, setting it up as a business and putting it into a, uh, a program to, uh, to get tax advantages and income. We have a, a weekly webinar uh, hosted by an independent tax advisor, a guy by the name of Bill Lair. And um, you can sign up for those on our website, and learn all about that. It's a, a great way to, um, to get into the cruising lifestyle while you're still working and, and have a, an income uh, where, you know, a bank will, you know, give you a loan to buy a boat uh, and, and, you know, take tax dollars that you're, uh, that you're otherwise, uh, you know, not getting the benefit of and, and legitimately putting it into a, a boat business. So you can learn all about that uh, again on our website. Um, uh, this is our Waypoints website, so you can explore different destinations in the Caribbean and the Bahamas and, and other locations and talk to us about that. And uh, finally, uh, one, I was talking to Jim uh, uh, a few minutes before the start of the presentation, and uh, uh, we've been partnering with a group out of Italy for a Mediterranean concierge service. So if you don't happen to have a, a wife who speaks fluent French, uh, these folks can help you uh, organize all your marinas and assist you with delivery skippers to help you maybe on the first leg of your trip, get the boat from the West Coast of France into the Mediterranean. Um, you know, if it's your first time and, and uh, you know, you're looking for uh, a local, um, you know, they have great people that, that, uh, that can help you with this and organizing all of the marina space and dockage, you know, dockage in, in, in Italy and Croatia and elsewhere. And in addition, they've got a, a partnership with a group that does these really cool VIP excursions into, you know, private chateaus that are, that are owned by, by Italian royalty. And you can, you can go and have a dinner and just a, an, an amazing location and the little side trips that they organize for you. So this is also on our website. It's called the, med concierge service and um you know there's there's a lot of information there you can talk to valerie uh or one of our other uh, yacht consultants about that if you're thinking about you know hey i'm having a, i'm ordering a, a new boat it's it's going to be completed in april or march hey why not spend the first month or a couple of months exploring some of these beautiful locations in the med like jim and valerie did so uh 
Lots of resources here at Atlantic Cruising Yachts. Jim, Valerie, thank you so much for taking the time to share your, your story. And um, thank you everybody that joined us. Cheers. And uh, we'll look forward to, uh, to our next episode, which will be coming soon. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Chris. Thanks, Chris. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Cheers. Bye. Cheers. Cheers.